We are uh, back with Tyler Suters now, who, who is live in Copenhagen on day three of World Climate Talks. And uh, Tyler, you were uh, chatting, you actually had a chance to uh, talk to EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson earlier today. Uh, that's right, and it was an absolute zoo in the conference room, Susan, a makeshift conference room set up by the U.S. delegation here in Copenhagen. Not much room, but a great deal of anticipation for what she was going to say and what, if any, message she would send regarding the U.S. delegation in relation to the endangerment finding that was announced on Monday. I want to show you the scene inside this room earlier today when Jackson delivered her keynote address. She touched on many of the same topics we heard on Monday when she announced the endangerment finding. She said the impact of everyday activities is affecting our health. Climate change, she said, is now a household issue. She also talked about the Obama administration, as she said, fighting to make up for long lost time, a reference to the eight years of inaction, as she put it, under the Bush administration. $80 billion spent on clean energy during the Obama administration, a point we've heard Jackson make before. And she also said when she mentioned the endangerment finding, how happy she was regarding her earlier work in New Jersey and the establishment of Reggie. She was met with applause when she mentioned the endangerment finding. And following her official comments, I did ask her about the potential effect of that regulation on the U.S. negotiating position here. In your mind, does the endangerment finding give the U.S. delegation power to go beyond the emissions targets that have been mentioned in legislation when negotiating an international deal? Yeah, the, the, the endangerment finding and the work here are separate. Certainly, I am glad that we were able to complete the finding and make that statement uh, just before. We barely got in, but just before. But that wasn't the impetus for our work. In fact, if you've been following our work at EPA, since President Obama became president, one of the first things, the very first thing he did is tell us look back at car uh, standards. And as a result, we now have clean car rules that are coming out. And then in April, we uh, finally put out a proposed endangerment finding. It had been sitting for years since the Supreme Court told us, mandated that we do it. So uh, again, I'm not going to uh, uh, comment on the negotiations here. I will say that I believe what it makes clear is that the United States uh, acknowledges the threat and that we are, as a government, under the Obama administration, doing everything we can to move forward on this issue because we acknowledge our responsibility and we acknowledge that we have to make up for lost time. So if the U.S. position seems to be strengthening on one hand, there are still questions about the Chinese and Indian delegations, major emitters, in China's case the number one in the world, and where they stand regarding an internationally binding treaty. China and India both in recent weeks, as we've reported, introduced internal carbon intensity targets, but they are still seemingly very much opposed to any binding targets in an international agreement. Yesterday, I talked one-on-one -on -one with UN Climate Chief Ivo de Boer about that, and even though he concedes that the Chinese and Indians are not budging so far, he does see hope somewhere on the horizon. I understand that, because the, the deal that actually launched this negotiating process two years ago talks about rich countries taking targets and developing countries taking action. And the developing nations like China want to stick to what was agreed then. That doesn't mean they're unwilling to put very ambitious plans on the table, and it doesn't mean that they're not willing to write those plans into national law. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the role of the governments and the negotiations going on right now, Mr. Secretary, uh, if or when an international binding agreement does come out of this, there will be an onus placed on private industry to abide by these changes and, in a sense, evolve under the new rules. What is the communication like right now between government parties and NGOs, the private industry here in Copenhagen, in terms of what may come out of this? Well, this is an intergovernmental process. It's governments talking to each other, which unfortunately means that, that business and non-governmental organizations take a bit of a back seat. But there has been a dialogue. And what I hear industry crying out for is clarity from governments. Tell us where you intend to go so we can make relevant investment decisions. There is a clear call from private industry, Mr. Secretary, in the U.S. regarding a price on carbon. The private sector wants that price implemented, uh, preferably in leg legislation over regulation. Are you hearing similar sentiments echoed internationally or outside of the EU, places where there is not a price on carbon? Yes. In fact, I think about 23% of the U.S. economy is already under a trading scheme in California, in the 
uh, some of the states closer to, to Canada. Europe is working on emissions trading, Australia is doing the same. And in fact, even many developing countries like Mexico, South Africa, Korea are moving in the same direction. So what I actually see is moving towards is a global carbon market and a global carbon price over time. Given your extensive background with the EU, are you very encouraged by what you've seen through the ETS uh, over the last four years? There are certainly detractors and critics out there who point to it as a failure. Uh, in equal amount, if not more, say it has been an overwhelming success. I think it started off as a confidence building exercise that in the beginning over generous emission rights were allocated to companies to let them get used to the system mm -hmm. and now that's being tightened up as targets become more ambitious over time. So mm -hmm. um, in a way it, it, it started as, as a learning by doing exercise. Mm -hmm. Would you imagine the same thing happening if there were a worldwide system in, that, in the terms of there being a phase one or a learning process as well? Uh, good points. There might, there might well be. Uh, in a way, internationally, we already have some experience with this, but then on a more project-by-project -project basis through th something called the Clean Development Mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, but, but let's see how that goes. Back to the U.S. position, I asked DeBoer about the president's arrival, President Obama's arrival next week. And he said that is part of the reason that he is more optimistic than ever that an international treaty will be completed, Susan, by the end of this conference or perhaps shortly thereafter. All right, we shall see about that. Tyler, what are you hearing about this latest skirmish that's making headlines here in the U.S., this controversial Danish text that was apparently leaked, accusations of this secret draft agreement apparently uh, uh, being accused among for developed countries for coming up with that. We, uh, the U.N. leaders there are, are denying that this, there's anything um, really to do about this. And I think it made headlines around the world, Susan, but that has died down to a large degree today. Ivo de Boer issued that statement last night, which we have on our site here on Clean Skies News, denying that, saying this is not a big deal. There is no secret agreement. All of these draft agreements are introduced and it is part of the process. Nothing is official until it goes through the proper channels. Nonetheless, the chairman of the G77 today, that is the bloc of developing nations, had very harsh words about what is being referred to as the Danish text that you mentioned. He called this an attempt to bypass the UNFCCC. Also from that man, Chairman Lumumba, he said that this is an effort that is excluding poorer nations from the table and giving rich nations more power. Not long after he said that to the press, Clean Sky's Margaret Ryan asked Ivo de Boer directly about these allegations about the Danish text. De Boer responded by saying this is simply one of many informal drafts we're dealing with, and these are integral to the process of coming up with any international agreement. And he actually said the chairman of the G77, Lumumba himself, who issued those allegations earlier, that he was present at the informal discussions when the Danish text came up. So we're hearing two sides, Susan, very different, but I imagine the commotion will die down quickly because one UN leader after another is quite simply saying this is not a big deal. Okay, Tyler Suter's live in Copenhagen. Thank you. We look forward to more of your reports on the site throughout the day.